would turn with me to the book of Acts. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2, and we're going to start reading in just a few moments with verse 37. And as you were turning there, and I am as well, uh, an out-of-towner, this guy drove his car into a ditch uh, in a pretty rural, isolated area. And uh, luckily, you know, a local farmer came to help him, saw um, with his, uh, came to help him with his, let me get this off first. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Whew, forgot I had that on. How did that happen? <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Um, so, luckily this local farmer came to help the guy. And he had his big, strong horse named Buddy. And so he, he hitched Buddy up to the car, and he yelled, <clears throat> Pull, Nelly, pull. Buddy didn't move. You would expect that, right? <laughs> yeah, so Then the farmer, he, he yelled, Pull, Buster, pull. And again, Buddy did not respond. So once more, the farmer said, Pull, Sally, pull. Nothing. Nothing happened. So nonchalantly, the farmer just said, Pull, buddy, pull. And the horse easily dragged the car out of the ditch. And the guy was just, he was so appreciative. But more than that, he was just curious. He asked the farmer, why did you call the horse by the wrong name three times? And the farmer said, well, buddy's blind. And if he thought he was the only one pulling, well, he wouldn't have even tried. <laughs> Do you feel like that in your spiritual life sometimes? That you're the only one trying so why even keep going? We're going to look at that this morning in Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Would you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word? Beginning in verse 37. Now when they heard this, by the way, Peter has just preached the sermon that God gave him. The Holy Spirit came down and filled the believers there in that house. The result of that is Peter preaches a gospel message pointing from the Old Testament to the New, to who Jesus is. And after the sermon, the response is verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They were convicted and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Let's pray. Father of all grace, and all mercy. We praise you for this call upon our lives to receive eternal life in Jesus, your Son. And we thank you that you have placed us here in this moment, in this wonderful church. And we ask that you would draw others this morning to yourself so that they too may receive the gift of eternal life through faith and repentance. We ask that you would fill us as you filled the first believers with the Holy Spirit. We ask that you would give us unity of purpose and unity of mission. We pray that you would help us to understand your word and that we would be unified in the essentials and that we would give grace in the non-essentials and that we would be charitable in all areas. And we ask all of this in Jesus' powerful name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a seat. Thank you. Today's message is entitled, Joining the Team. Is church membership biblical? Joining the team, is church membership biblical? Biblical. Now, I don't normally just randomly pick text uh, to preach on or topics to preach on. I'm not a topical preacher. I'm uh, an expositional preacher, meaning that we normally stick with a book, uh, and then we go verse by verse, line by line through that book, exposing what God has in there for us. But 
the reason I chose this topic today is because of several of the questions and comments I received at the end uh, or after the last sermon I preached. I didn't preach last week, I preached two weeks ago. And we were in Jude and I kept asking the question, Jude's main thought is uh, contend for the faith. So I kept asking the question, are you a contender or a pretender? And at the very end of the, the, the sermon, I was dealing with uh, different areas that we tend to live under false pretenses. And one of those areas I mentioned uh, was stop pretending to be a church member and take the step of faith to join the Highland family. And so I heard some comments after that. People were questioning, you know, not questioning what I was saying, but just it got some talking stirred up. And that's a good thing, right? And so it got me thinking to the point that I wanted to address this topic of is church membership biblical? Well, those, there are people that uh, probably, uh, undoubtedly, there's got to be somebody in here this morning or even online that would, uh, that would say, well, no, church membership is not biblical. In one respect, I would agree with you. You'd be right in one respect. Because if you're looking for a command in the New Testament to join a local church, you're not going to find one. And then there are others that will say, I don't need to be a church member to be saved. Well, I mean, again, I'm not going to argue with you there. By grace, you have been saved through faith. Okay. Um, along with that understanding, people would say that I am part of the church, the global invisible church, God's family. Again, total agreement there. Others say, you know, I don't like organized religion. I, I don't like all that. Churches are too organized. They're too structured. They're too, too many committees, too many boards and things like that. And, and it made me think of, you know what a giraffe is, right? It's a horse put together by a committee. <laughs> so, so they may have a point there. Well, there are other objections, but these are the ones that I hear mainly. Let's say that those are some of your objections here, or you've heard those. But what if you're wrong? What if one of the greatest blessings that God has for you and for me is only experienced through a covenanting relationship inside of a local church? Cyprian, a third century church leader, once wrote this. He said, the spouse of Christ cannot be adulterous. She is uncorrupted and pure. She knows one home. She guards with chaste modesty the sanctity of one couch. She keeps us for God. She appoints the sons whom she has borne for the kingdom. Whoever is separated from the church and is joined to an adulteress is separated from the promises of the church. Nor can he who forsakes the church of Christ attain to the rewards of Christ. He is a stranger. He is profane. He is an enemy. Listen to this. This is his famous statement. He can no longer have God as his father who has not the church for his mother. Now, what he's saying is that you cannot claim to be a child of God if you don't want to join Christ's body, both locally and globally. So here's my proposition. Church membership was a biblical thing before it was a Baptist thing, okay? Let's uh, kind of get that out there. And in, in fact, when we look at church membership, it's not a question of personal preference but of biblical obedience. And at this point, there's got to be people already thinking, well, okay, I'm a church member. I can just, uh, maybe he'll ask me to leave like he did the, you know, two weeks ago. <laughs> and I don't, there's nothing else in here for me because I'm a church member. I'm good. Hold on now. You know that there's always something in here for all of us, right? So this sermon is just as much for our Highland family members as it is for those who are not yet. So what do I mean by that? Did you know that we have 544 active members, what's considered active members. We have 707 inactive members, meaning those are those people who have moved away or moved to another church and haven't requested a letter. That's 1,251 people on our membership. And an average attendance on Sunday mornings up until maybe this week uh, for Sunday was around 245. And we think, man, that... That's pretty good, right? 245 in a, in a summer, that's good. Or pre-COVID, we were right at 300 every Sunday. God was moving, and I do think he was doing that. And, but but that, when you look at those numbers, we think, that's awesome. But let me ask you a question. Since when does having a sixth of the team show up sound like we're winning? Let's say that we're at least half of the team, 245 out of 544. How well do you think the football team is going to do if 
you know, if the kicker, the defensive end, linebacker, and quarterback show up. Chet, how do you think that's going to – you going to win? No, you're not going to win. Chet's a football coach, by the way, so. <laughs> how, how's the baseball team going to do with only the pitcher and the center fielder showing up? Probably don't have much of a chance, do they? See, we've got these numbers and all these things so backwards. Church membership matters to the point that we want to know where these people are, what is happening in their life, where are they spiritually with Christ. It matters to the point that we want our earthly roles to reflect as much as we can God's heavenly role. That's how much this matters. So this is a message for all of us, and so I'm about to get to the big idea, but I needed to deal with a few of these things before we jump into the text. But a couple of definitions that matter for our, our understanding this morning of is church membership biblical? And obviously the big question is, what is the church then? If that's, if that's what we're looking at, let's answer the question, what is the church? The Greek word is ekklesia. I believe it's on the screen there. If you ever want to see it in Greek, it's up there or it will be at some point. Uh, it's mentioned 114 times in the New Testament. It means an assembly, church, or congregation. It comes from the root word kaleo, meaning to call out, to summon. Um, and the church globally, that's the invisible church, and the church locally, as it's expressed, is referred to in the Bible as an ecclesia, the called out one. So the church is called out from the world, to be separate from the world, and it is to increase, increasingly reflect the character of God in the world. Another word closely related to how the church does this through its relationships to one another is the Greek word koinonia. And so that word often gets translated as fellowship, and that's true, but it's deeper than just a quarterly potluck that we, you know, like to uh, have. Those are wonderful fellowship times, but this word means shared participation. In fact, it reminds us of the word joining, the actual English word joining, to bring together in a particular relation or for a specific purpose or action. So the church, what I'm contending is to be brought together, yes, uh, globally, but expressed locally for a specific purpose, for a specific action. And here's the big idea. You can write this in in our little, uh, I don't know where my thing went to right here. In this, you can keep these notes and take them down, but here's the first one right here. Is that the big idea of what I want to show you is that the difference between an attender and a member is summed up in one word commitment. The difference between an attender and a member is summed up in one word, commitment. So this is a word that our culture does not like. We can't be committed to anything. We have the attention span of a fruit fly, I think. We love our options, don't we? But we loathe obligations sometimes. And so if you want to be countercultural, if you want to fulfill the purpose God has for you and only a blessing that God has for those who are in a covenanting relationship with one another, commitment is more about than just showing up every week. So I'm going to show you three areas of our commitment as God's team here at Highland. And then I'm going to ask for some of you to make a definite commitment this morning. So number one, where do we see this? All right, as a team... We are committed to following Scripture. As a team, we are committed to following Scripture. Church membership may not have been commanded in the New Testament, but it was undeniably implied and applied in the New Testament. Where do I see that? Well, if you go back to verses 37 through 41, if you have your Bibles, don't, don't, uh, we won't put that on the screen, but if you're looking down at your Bibles, you can kind of peruse that and, and, and look over that again, but what you're going to see is that there were people that were hearing the message of the gospel who were far from God. They were not saved. They did not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They were apart from God. And so they were outside of God's true family, not the genealogy of being an Israelite, but the, the actual uh, seed of Abraham the, through the promise of Abraham. And they were from all over the globe in the known world at that time. They weren't just Jews in Jerusalem. They were all over the place. So you can see the idea of the invisible global church here being formed. But when they heard the gospel through repentance and faith in response to the preaching of God's word, they were brought into the family. This is what we call the birthday of the church, Pentecost. But notice that we don't just see the church global or the church universal here represented in all those different people groups 
But in verses 42 and 47, now we see the church localized in Jerusalem there. It says 42, sorry. And they devoted themselves. Who are they? Those who hung out after Pentecost. Those who were still and in Jerusalem living there. And they devoted themselves. This word devoted was it not a one-time commitment. It is a consistent action. This was their life now. What are they devoting themselves to? It, he goes on. The apostles' teaching. They wanted to hear God's word preached. To grow in, in the grace and knowledge of Jesus there. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. That is not just the idea of getting together. It literally is the idea of one another. They're devoting to the local body called the church. The breaking of bread, eating the Lord's Supper, eating meals together, and, and then to praying together. This sounds like a, a lot like a local church gathering to me. In fact, that's how we design our local church gatherings. It's why we have Lord's Supper. It's why we have worship. It's why we have preaching. All of these things are designed to, to imitate and to experience the same thing that the first century Christians did. So we also have a new, numerical record of those who were added to the church. 3,000 that day. And when Luke writes in verse 47, and the Lord added to their number day by day, that sounds to me like that they were actually tracking that number to see what God was doing. The New Testament just doesn't record this own instance in Acts, 42, or Acts 2. But think about these examples. Acts 6, 1 through 6. They had enough organization to handle deacon elections in the local church there in Jerusalem. Romans 16, 1 through 16, if you read through that chapter, you quickly will find out Paul was absolutely aware of who was church members, who was inside, and who was outside. 1 Timothy 5, Paul gives instructions on how to help widows. How would they know who the widows were unless there was a list of such women in a local body of believers? Mark Dever, in his uh, book, What is a Healthy Church, points out that when dealing with church discipline, in 2 Corinthians 2, 6, Paul uses the word majority. So how could there be a defined majority if there were no defined church membership? Paul cared deeply there in, in 2 Corinthians about who was in the local church and who was not. He cared because Jesus cares. Jesus grants the local church the authority to draw a line, to be the ecclesia, to be those who are separate from the world as much as they can be. So we have to also realize that these different letters that we have in the New Testament... These were written to local churches or local church pastors. And when we look at the New Testament, we see clearly there were lists of those who were inside the local church. We see a special relationship within the local church, one that church membership. Now, this is, a, I'm gonna, this is a big thing, but I don't have time to deal with it, but I'll just say it and we'll move on. But part of the relationship that goes on in the, the local church of being in this kind of special relationship is that church members can affirm your salvation okay that means that they're not if you're not a church member we can't we're not questioning your salvation but we can neither affirm it either because when you join a local body of believers all people come by the same way we believe that jesus is the one and the only he died for our sins he rose he's alive today and we see that worked out in relationship that's why we can affirm and so that's what's happening in the new testament as well if you're not uh, I mean, but we there's also organization involved. There's leaders and members, list of people. Church discipline, we'll talk about that later, was practiced also in church membership. Now think about this. Being an attender without becoming a member is like two chickens tied at the leg and thrown over a clothesline. They may be united, but they are absolutely not unified. They're not. As a team, we commit to following Scripture. Church membership may not have been commanded, but you can't deny it was implied or applied in the New Testament. It was there. Number two, as a team, we are committed to one another. As a team, we are committed to one another. I believe the greatest mark of a healthy church is a church who increasingly reflects the character of God. That's how we know if a church is healthy or not. Are we, as church members, can we attest to the fact that each one of us in our daily lives, when we see each other out of this building and in this building, I can see that the character of God is increasing in your life. And can you see that in mine? We can obviously do this in our personal lives of, you know, to reflect that character of God, even without being committed 
in a committed relationship like church membership, but God has given us the best place to do that, to practice this, church membership. In fact, there's two categories I want to show you within our commitment to one another, responsibility and accountability. Church membership first is about taking responsibility. Church membership is first about taking responsibility. In John 13, verse 34, the new commandment, Jesus gives that. He says, love one another. That word, one another, is the Greek word, alelon, okay? And it means one another, each other, mutually, reciprocally. And although, although that word, alelon, does not appear in our text in Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47, there's no doubt that there was a mutual and reciprocal responsibility shown to one another. He literally says in verse 44, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were responsible and accountable to one another. It also occurs 100 times in the New Testament. 59 of those times refers to how we treat other believers or how we are not to treat other believers. And that's why we call these the one another passages. And I, I think I've got these on the screen up there. But just a, a, not all of them, but just a quick list. Love one another, John 13, 34. Be devoted to one another, Romans 12, 10. Live in harmony with one another, Romans 12, 16. Care for one another, 1 Corinthians 12, 25. Serve one another, Galatians 5, 13. Bear with one another's burdens, Galatians 6, 2. Comfort one another, 1 Thessalonians 4, 18. Encourage one another, 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. Pray for one another, James 5, 16. And the list goes on and on and on. So as a team, we are responsible to do these things for one another. We are responsible for speaking the gospel into one another's lives. We are responsible for taking our part of the relationship serious enough that our greatest desire is to see one another reflect God's character more and more and more. We are responsible to help one another grow spiritually. And when we do not commit to church membership, we are robbing God's people of the fruit the gospel can produce in us and through us. It's our responsibility to do these things as church members in this kind of relationship. But also it's about accountability. As a team, we hold one another accountable. First, we can see that in 1 uh, uh, Corinthians 5, 1 through 12, Paul wrote to address this particular vulgar sin that was happening it was not only being committed by a church member, but other church members were attesting to the fact that, man, look at God's evidence of grace, that this guy could still do that, and God still loves him and can save him. Well, that's not the way Paul saw it. <laughs> in verse 2, he says, kick the guy out of the church. How can the guy be in if he, or out if he's not already in a body like this? And so in verses 11 and 12, they're to practice church discipline inside the church how in the world would this work if there were no formal local body of believers here discipline is by the way biblically is never to expel the person and then forget about the person it's to uh, uh to restore this person to a good and right relationship with christ and his body yes globally but more importantly locally and i think a greater example of this actually this accountability is found in hebrews thirteen seventeen. there it says Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Notice there are leaders and followers in the church. God doesn't call everyone to lead, but he calls everyone to submit, right? Even me. Submit here means to follow the spiritual lead. So if there are no biblical requirements of church membership, then as a Christian, who in the world are you supposed to submit to? You're supposed to submit to Brother Danny over at Northcrest? Maybe Charles Stanley, David Jeremiah, Tony Evans. Those are great preachers. But who are you supposed to submit to if you're not a church member? More than that, as a pastor, who am I in charge of if there's no biblical church membership? Who will I give an account of? Will I give an account of some random guy walking around uh, Meridian that says he's a Christian holding a sign? I mean, who, who am I? Am I, am I uh, to be responsible for... One of, you know, the, somebody in here that comes in at random every now and then? Of course not, right? As the pastor of Highland, I am charged by God to keep watch, to shepherd your souls, to protect your souls. And one day, I will give an account of, of how I have pastored you, how I have shepherded you, how I have fed you, how I have protected you. 
How am I supposed to know who is God's and who is not if I'm not in a close relationship with that is expressed by church membership? And hear this, because I mean it with all the love that I have in me. I will give an account for every single person that I pastor. But some of you will also have to stand before the Lord and give an account for why you did not have a pastor. This goes both ways. I know that some of you think you're not that important to the body, but you are. More than you think. Swindoll kind of makes mention a rooster minus a hen equals no baby chicks, right? Kellogg minus a farmer equals no cornflakes. There are, if nails aren't made, what good is a hammer? The most skilled ER doctor still needs the ambulance driver to deliver the patient. And just as Rogers needed Hammerstein, someone in this church needs you. As a team, we are committed to one another and our spiritual growth through our mutual responsibility and mutual accountability. So we are committed to following scripture. We're committed to one another. And lastly, I want to show you that we're committed to Jesus's mission. We're committed to Jesus's mission. If you look back at verses 42 through 47, again, you see that the early disciples committed themselves. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to gathering locally together, to the Lord's Supper, to praying together. They were committed together for Jesus' mission. And then Jesus, in return, was committed to reaching their city through them because we see that. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Our commitment to Jesus' mission is accomplished through our commitment to one another. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 talks about the Great Commission, that we are to go and make disciples. And we do this on two levels, right? We do it by baptizing new believers, teaching them what Jesus has taught us. And, and, and we do that together. This is how we do this as a local church body. Sunday school teachers, small group leaders, all of these areas are where disciple making is happening within the local church. We also do it by our mission involvement. Fulfilling the Great Commission takes cooperation. Yes, we cooperate in the Southern Baptist Convention, but it takes cooperation within the local church. If I was only wanting to do what I wanted to do and just preach, and that was it, well, and you only wanted to do what you wanted to do, whatever that was in the church, how much of the mission do you think we're actually going to take place? Probably not much. We're just going to build silos in our ministries and in the church, and mission is not going to be done. But here, what we see in Acts is that they were devoted to the mission because they were devoted to it together. They were in this membership, this, this relationship together. In fact, um, I remember uh, back at Love Out Loud, Marcus Hayes, I'm going to steal this from him, and, and, and not that he watches us, I'm sure he doesn't, but... If he did, I'm still giving him credit, but we're going to start using this because I love it so much because it makes the point is that every time we come in here and you can hold me accountable, we're going to say this saying together to, to remind us why we're here and what we're doing when we leave here. Say, so, so here's the saying, this is just the huddle. This is just the huddle, but out there is where we play the game. This is just the huddle out there is the game. Okay, so I'm going to say, this is just the huddle. And after I say out there, you say, we play the game. So this is just the huddle. Out there is what? This is just the huddle. Out there is what? One more time. This is just the huddle. Out there is where we play the game. That's what we're talking about. We have to have this tight-knit relationship that is only done through the Holy Spirit in our life to keep us tied together, heading in the right direction. As a team, we are committed to Jesus' mission. All right, I'll land the plane here. So every Sunday, every Sunday, we have different groups of people that come in and out of this building or in and around this building. Okay, follow me here. Uh, Drew, I think I've got a slide on this. It's got uh, little concentric circles up there. I do, uh, see if we can find that one. Um, and so every day, this is what's happening in and around us, okay? We have, um, we have uh, the community at large. Jesus had a community at large. These are just people that don't really have any interest in Jesus. They don't have, they, you know, just doesn't ever, it's not on their radar. It, in fact, this is our mission field, or is the community at large. And then we go a little bit further, and we see that there's a crowd. Um, and in that crowd, 
And that was people that, uh, you know, were around Jesus. He had big crowds that would follow him, the 5,000 that wanted to be fed. And these are people that may come in. They may not all the time. They're kind of sporadic. They're a little bit interested in Jesus, but they're not so much. They want to be, you know, they want to be in, uh, they want to have proximity to Jesus, but they definitely don't want to be identified with him. And so then we move into the congregation, and that's the type of group that would follow him around. And they were affiliated with Jesus but as the uh, word says that, you know, they weren't a follower. They were a fan, but not a follower. And so we have, we have uh, you know, congregation like that. This, this is people that would definitely be church members on paper, but they're good with their level of commitment. You know, they come, they check the box. This is what I've got to do. And I feel good about that. That's the congregation. And then the committed, we go a little bit further into that. These are, you know, that was Jesus's group of 12 and even one of those turned out to be a traitor, right? So, um, but that's Jesus' group of 12. And in here, you know, our committed are those who are serving. I mean, they're, they're committed to, you know, the mission of Jesus here. They're probably growing spiritually, serving in areas of the church. Jesus' core, if we move in a little further, was Peter, James, and John. And the core of our local church would be those few that, you know, they're sold out for Jesus and everybody knows it. Like they know, man, this person is growing and they're involved. And man, look how God's using this person. And then you get to the commissioned in that last little concentric circle. And it has an arrow going out from it. These were the believers that God used to birth the brand new church that we read about or we have read about in Acts. This group is growing spiritually still. They're sold out to Jesus. But added to those, they are being used by Jesus to further his mission. They're involved in the mission to continue to make disciples who make disciples. Now, the whole membership talk that we've had this morning, every bit of it has been about showing you where you are as, are you part of the community? Are you part of the crowd? Are you part of the congregation? Are you part of the committed? Are you part of the core? Or are you part of the commission? And then moving you from where you are to where God wants you to be. Obviously, God wants us to be part of the commission but that doesn't happen overnight we grow spiritually as we grow physically right is that we grow in phases like that so my question here is where are you on that are you still a, a spectator on the outside um, if that's who you are then you need to join Jesus on the field you need to join Christ in his family. It's about this spiritual movement this spiritual growth in your life so for some of you the first step your next step may be that you move from being a part of the crowd to becoming a part of Jesus' family. And it's very simple. The Bible says we all have sin and we all fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And the results of our sin, Romans 6.23, is that the wages of sin is death. We are spiritually, and if we die without Christ, we will be physically separated from God for eternity. But the second part of verse 6.23 is that says, but the uh, free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So although you have earned death by your sin and by your rejection of Jesus, God is offering you free life in him if you'll come to him today. In a few moments, we're going to have a time of invitation where you can do that and say, Brother David, I want this free life that Jesus offers me. And that could be true of you today. Salvation could be yours today. Your eternal address can be changed today if you'll come and turn from your sin and turn to Christ through faith. But for some of you, maybe you have been saved, but you've never followed in believer's baptism. If that's you, listen clearly. You'll never be able to take the next step in your spiritual growth until you get the first things right. There's no way that you're going to be obedient in the rest of it if we're not obedient in the very first things. And so in just a few moments, in, in moments when we have invitation time or response time, you come down and say, hey, I haven't been baptized. I need to do that. We don't, we're not going to do it today, but unless you really want to, then we'll praise God and we'll do it. But we'll schedule it, okay? And we'll do it. Get that right with God. For some of you, that next step may be that you've been here a long, long time. Or you may have been here for four months. It doesn't matter. But you know that God has you here. Today is the day, my friend. Put your pride aside and join the team officially say yes to Jesus this morning and for some of you your next step may be that uh, you just need to move from being one of the committed to the core 
God is calling you out on the field. He has work for you to do. The fields are white as to harvest. So if you want to take that next step, then I'm going to urge you to see one of our ministerial staff members. We would love to find a place to put you on the field and where God is using you. Right, guys? Absolutely. Wherever you are, God wants you to move from where you are right now to the next step in your spiritual growth. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time. We ask that you would take charge over it. God, that you would soften our hearts. You would move within us. God, and that we would obey completely what you're calling us to do right now. So we give you this time, and we want to honor you with it. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.